Hello, and uh, <clears throat> welcome to our webinar on rethinking prior authorization with artificial intelligence. I'm Sarmana. I am the founder and CEO of Banjo Health, and I'm excited to have you all here with us today. I want to thank Weedy for setting this up and allowing us to share our story with all of you. Uh, so at Banjo Health, we believe that AI has the potential to really transform the healthcare industry and address some of the biggest challenges that is facing us today. <clears throat> One area that's ripe for changeup is the prior authorization process. Traditionally, PA has been a bottleneck that has led us to poor member and provider experience and really worsening out some member outcomes, especially when there's delays in those PA determinations. But it is mission critical process for all of the payer and PBM processes out there. And is at Banjo Health, we really believe there's a better way to take on the prior authorization process and make it a way that's gonna improve the experience for all parties. That's why we're thrilled to be able to share with you today how we're using artificial intelligence to dramatically reduce the time and effort it takes to process PA requests and getting your members and patients and providers access in a timely sense to appropriate care. So joining us today, I'm really excited to introduce to you Shannon Fee, our head of data science, and Vanessa Cheng, our VP of product. They'll be sharing with you some details about how we're using AI in prior authorization and how AI can help payers respond to their needs more quickly and more efficiently than ever before. With that, let's go ahead and get started. Shannon, Vanessa, floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Sar. Um, uh, whoever is advancing the slide, please move the next slide, please. Cool. Got it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so before we go into the exciting places that AI is being used in prior authorization um, and in health tech beyond, I think it's first important that we address kind of the main concerns when using AI and health technology. Um, obviously, AI is very powerful. It's getting more powerful as every year passes. Um, but especially in health tech, we really have to care a lot about patient privacy and the security of our data. Um, we cannot move data around um, at, to the same degree um, that you can when you're dealing with kind of all articles on the internet. Um, with prior auth and really any sector of utilization management, you need to make sure that any decisions that the AI is impacting are still explainable and auditable um, in order to remain compliant. Um, and in addition to that, we have to have an extremely high bar um, on accuracy in terms of putting AI in a place where it's being fully automated and not having a feedback loop with a person in it. Um, so with that, I'll pass the baton kind of off to Vanessa. Sure. So as we think about prior auth today, we recognize that it is a um, human heavy process. Oftentimes um, we have technology really to support all of the transactional workflows that exist, but at the end of the day, it still requires expertise, um, specialized knowledge, and certainly wisdom based off of our subject matter experts to be able to really drive the decision-making process. So in terms of the current state of prior auth, we all recognize this. I'm sure many of our audience members here today have either experienced it firsthand themselves, whether as a patient or a family member advocating for um, better care, as well as practitioners or clinicians and administrators that are responsible for on the receiving end once a request has been made and or have to act upon um, the determination. So we recognize that that process certainly and, and the time duration that it takes to a determination or to a decision and even prescribing that medication or um, procedure and approving it really is, is heavy on transcription and form validation. Um, I know numerous um, organizations that are heavily involved with regards to that are um, really using people power to push um, a lot of uh, the in ingestion and the intake through. Um, a lot of cross-checking um, across multiple systems. Um, I think one of our more recent clients that we spoke with, they mentioned six different systems um, and sometimes even upwards of double digits if they have to 
address patient member demographics all the way through to send out of notifications, they're seeing that they have to always toggle or click through screens and different applications or tools uh, to really get the answers that they need. And of course, we all recognize that in healthcare, it is a very highly sensitive arena with regards to pri privacy and security. Um, and all of that also centers around the focal points of a lot of the agencies um, that really dictate um, better care at the state level, at the federal level. So I'm, I'm alluding to um, NCQA, uh, you know, CMS, uh, really initiatives and regulations that constantly, constantly require uh, updating and maintenance of whatever you have in the system um, to reflect um, best practice. So I'm sure you're wondering, you know, that's great that Banjo is able to solve this. And what are some of the other folks in the industry and what have they been doing as of late? What are some of the, the trends that we've been seeing in the past few years? So if we jump right in, um, taking a look at real world clinical data, oftentimes you'll see um, some of the larger entities out there, certainly um, your Microsofts, your AWS, you're seeing a lot of usage of real world clinical data. And in short, it's really any time a patient encounters uh, a, an episode of care, um, a lot of that data really transcends through a myriad of data exchanges or is really then aggregated in a meaningful way where a, a lot of um, organizations are, um, and even competitors and, and things of that nature, they are assessing, um, a lot of the tech companies today are assessing, how does this then feed into um, better care practices? How would I be able to look at maybe symptom surveillance, things uh, re regards to outcomes? What does my population look like? What, uh, what am I seeing in terms of submission with regards to PAs? What are they seeing in terms of perhaps um, patterns uh, and even um, drugs and therapeutic lines of care? What does that look like? Um, and how am I utilizing some of the information that either I'm getting straight from a um, portal or an EMR platform um, and being able to assess that information readily? Another example is uh, one that many of us are familiar with. Uh, we've seen this in some of our apps that we use, even when it comes to, uh, let's say, I would take a picture of a receipt and the receipt, and then you're able to kind of capture the details of a receipt into, you know, structured fields. So um, that's very oversimplification of how that works in healthcare, of course. Uh, but really, there have been significant gains in the past few years with regards to handwriting recognition. I know um, the picture on the right is quite familiar also with a bunch of people. I know um, back in the day, my pro provider also wrote on paper charts. Luckily, we've trended away from this now, um, thanks to a myriad of initiatives and also regulations that um, deviate from this. Um, but really the, the last mile that we're seeing is, well, that's great that you're able to take in a PDF pre-filled form. Would you be able to perform that same level of accuracy and tuning for something such as handwriting? Um, and oftentimes um, the optical character recognition piece of, of scanning an image um, is paired very closely and coupled with natural language processing. And so we often say, okay, well, now that I know what the words are on the page, can I make sense of that um, thereafter? Or am I able to then boost what I would find to make grammatical sense, um, syntactical sense of the words um, in its compilation? Because essentially you're reconstituting a lot of what is otherwise um, not capturable. And what we're also seeing is this huge push for better uh, precision recall or performance when it comes to AI, because a lot of the drivers to what you're going to what you, we're going to share today is, well, am I able to readily capture clinical entities um, within a record itself? Is it, um, it's great that I can get it through, you know, HL7 fire data formats, but what happens if it's, you know, sprinkled into the text itself? What happens, am I able to actually surface the clinical entity where I can find an ICD code um, readily? Am I able to capture the CPT code, the NDC codes, and, and all the 
affiliate um, J codes and, and things like that um, so that I can really um, automate or establish workflow rules uh, upon that. So going into also automation of rules, we're seeing a lot of organizations and companies really um, hone in on how can we get to a faster decision? Are we able to, with all of those components that I previously mentioned and also a myriad of obviously development work, uh, be able to shortcut this path. If I know that an EP, uh, a PA smells like this, it has the characteristics of that, uh, that I'm really able to come to a decision faster with very, very minimal touch um, from, from a human. Um, am I able then also to detect any type of deficiencies um, or where I'm not quite meeting uh, compliance or turnaround times? Am I able to capture that with the utilization of AI um, to inform me that a deficiency or an anomaly has been seen? Um, in addition to that, in, in terms of optimizing work streams, we always hear this, uh, how can we be more efficient? How can we um, utilize the same group of folks, uh, but have a higher PA volume throughput? Um, but what is more important too then is how does the PA change hands throughout the ecosystem? And as you think about um, this presentation, Shirley, and, and walk away from this, Part of that exchange is the traceability and the capture of um, that, what I call handling, um, or really who are the custodians of a PA transaction. So as we think about this um, for the, really the remainder of the, the session, um, I, I always put these two images side by side. They're a good juxtaposition of kind of the current state and where we really want to be. Um, in, as we talk about the evolution of um, prior auths and how numerous folks are really addressing the, these pain points, um, hopefully we can move away from what we know and have seen uh, with regards to PAs and having to fill them out in, in such a fashion and really finally maybe even taking the, the fax machine out back um, and, and give it its um, final resting place. So I'm sure you're all wondering, well, that's great that there's all these um, ideas out there and approaches and, and you know, you, you can't boil the ocean. So what did we do um, that is a little bit more um, focused and, and narrow um, in, with regards to what we want to accomplish? So as you guys know, um, the, in the previous slide, there are several um, really administrative and operational burdens that with, exist within a PA. We, we framed that question of what can we really solve for? Um, from there, you, the way to think about it really is then how do we establish what the goals are and what the outcomes we want to have come out of um, an AI-driven AI um, solution? And so there's several things to factor in. And I'm sure, again, many of your organizations would probably have a product team, product strategy team that really coalesces all of and aggregates all of that information feeding in. So we're talking market appetite, technical traceability. Um, what your customers are saying, um, and also what the competition is also um, looking at. And the one thing to know, um, as you guys hear in the news and media, of course, um, is that AI is not perfect out of the box. It takes refinement. It takes um, numerous iterations to be able to get to where you need to be. And so it's really then recognizing the um, benchmark of benchmarking the baseline results and then iterating up upon that and, and establishing multiple touch points on how performance has improved. Next slide, please. So then looking at how Banjo works, um, our solution is uh, really an end-to-end prior authorization lifecycle management tool that takes um, and recognizes multiple methods of intake of uh, the input so that a case would then be created. There is kind of this branch off where uh, we're really leading in and recognizing that the criteria selection and the decision tree for whether or not a patient um, is medically and clinically um, 
necessitates for a particular medication or part, a particular procedure, um, that, that is the single most important driver in that landscape. And this is our approach. Uh, you know, again, other organizations have taken different approaches towards this, but we recognize that oftentimes to get to the decision, you have to sort of know the decision tree um, to start off with and result in a decision. Um, and then as you as that feeds that information and a clinical reviewer um, adjudicates off of the patient's um, medical evidence, um, the member's information, uh, that really lends itself into being able to, one, know what that recommendation um, upfront looks like and the medical evidence that supports it. Um, and that, of course, trickles into the rest of the, the workflow of determination and notification. So then touching back on what I mentioned with regards to establishing the right goals and outcomes for what AI should be in our system, um, we really broke it down into uh, two buckets, um, but really the, the larger impact is our biggest driver. So we, we talked about um, the most time consuming, highest operational burdens that several folks, including our clients, competitors, and the marketplace has been saying with regards to that. And oftentimes it talks about not only the um, intake process that you saw in that first left lane, but also then the information surfacing and being able to come up um, with a decision as part of the clinical review. How do I surface the medical evidence readily so that the more relevant information is upfront? Um, and I'm really um, emphasizing or uh, allowing our SMEs to be able to um, identify those data points readily. Um, so, and it really takes the SME uh, subject matter expert from you know being the person that has to click through and tab through and double check into a person that really then a role a capacity uh, to be able to say well I based off of all the medical evidence I am verifying everything all in one place um, and I then want to um, put my final stamp on it and push it on its way so you, we're really elevating um, the competencies of an SME. So really two, thing, two major um, goals or KPIs um, that we really march towards. So you'll see two things today. It is our um, composer uh, product, which really aims to reduce the policy upload and maintenance times. Um, so policies, uh, some folks I know, uh, other organizations might call them rules or criteria, um, but really at the end of the day, it's being able to manage them in a very a swift fashion. Um, am I then allowing and empowering my PNT teams, for example, uh, to be able to address, uh, you know, whether it's typos, reorganization of those rules, um, limitations, change in approval lengths, things like that, um, very readily. Uh, similarly, on the um, PA review, clinical review side, um, we have what we call the CARE um, AI engine, which really aims to reduce the time to determination, um, time to determination um, aspect of it, where when it comes to being able to increase the PA volume throughput, am I able to also minimize the need or um, the necessity for reopen that, reopenings or um, reconsiderations? In addition to that, with regards to um, earlier requ requests for information, a lot of our users have mentioned you know, that it, one of the tenets of stalling or a PA getting stuck is oftentimes that they find out very later on that an RFI is needed in the PA life cycle. Could we then preemptively or push forward some of those um, discrepancies or deficiencies earlier on so that the solicitation can happen um, immediately? Um, so with that, I'm going to kind of walk through how the AI is involved in our composer process, um, and then Vanessa is going to give a brief demo of that composer product, um, and then I'll walk through how CARE works as well. Um, 
So Composer, uh, the place that the AI is involved is in that document intake of your current criteria, policy document, whatever name you're giving them, um, in which we take that document in and then transform that into a series of programmatic rules that a reviewer can use during their PA case review. Um, document intake is kind of split into three separate functions. Um, so the first thing that happens when we're processing your document is we're splitting that document into single logical units or clauses. Um, so if you have a bulleted criteria document, each bullet would be, uh, be a singular clause. Um, after that, we're gonna transform whatever text you have in your original document into a question. Um, so if you have something along the lines of, you know, patient must be diagnosed with type two diabetes, we would turn that into a question of, does the patient have a diagnosis of type two diabetes? Um, and then the third piece that we're doing is relating the clauses. So saying, if you answer yes or no to, to the previous question, this is the next question that you should go to. Um, and so in this process, we're using a variety of um, large language models. We're using some rules engines. It's kind of a hodgepodge of various techniques that have been shown to work best on the data we've seen thus far. Um, and then after this intake has happened, we output a decision tree in the Composer app that a user can go through and edit, confirm, and validate. So when you're editing, you're doing things like adding or removing clauses. So sometimes like a header from a document will show up in the decision tree. And obviously you don't really care if it was page three of 20 or whatever that header says. Um, you can do things like changing the question text. So if there are grammatical errors um, or if you wanna change the nuance of that question, you can do that. And you can also update relationships. So if we said that after answering yes to does the patient have diabetes, you should go to approve, but actually you want to go to deny or you know, insert any next clause as well, um, you can make that change as well. Um, we have various things to ensure that your tree is logically valid. Um, so we do a fair amount of testing that confirms that your tree is logically complete, that you don't have circular logic. Um, that no matter what, you're going to get to some sort of status along the lines of approve, deny, or request for more information. Um, and then you can also logically test your tree with a stepper that kind of mimics going through the review, lets you plug in answers to various questions, and allows you to ensure that you really are ending up at the correct decision node, um, that you are ending up in an approve when you should really be approved. And then after you're done with this editing, you've validated, um, you've got whatever level of sign off you need within the system, you publish your tree. And at that point, we use the changes you made to go into a model retraining so that when you upload subsequent documents, it's more accurate. So you'll see less grammatical errors. The relationships are better, more accurate, um, and you're seeing less of those headers showing up within your intake intake and criteria tree. Um, so the key piece of this and what we really strive to ensure is that it's designed around having a human feedback loop and ensuring that your reviewers are still the ones at the end of the day signing off, confirming, and ensuring that you are using the logic you want to use um, for any plans in your system. And that also you can edit it to whatever degree you need um, to be compliant. Uh, as you need. Um, so with that, I'll hand it off to Vanessa for a quick demo of the system. Vanessa, you're muted. Thank you. I'm like talking no into the ethos. Um, so as we come into the Banjo platform, we're really looking at the Composer product. And here, um, I want to bring everyone's focus into the Decision Tree Library. And really, for any of our clients that onboard with us, um, we understand and recognize that they might have upwards of 300 to 600, and possibly even more, depending on the number of plans um, that folks support, uh, that there is kind of this one 
one-stop shop repository of decision trees uh, that folks can really utilize and, and manage and, and call uh, very easily with regards to some of the search and filtering functionalities. Um, for the purposes of our discussion today, and I'll try to keep it brief because I'm already looking at the clock a little bit, um, that anytime we identify with our clients in terms of onboarding, um, we do an analysis of their uh, decision trees, uh, sorry, policies, and um, you have the ability to add and transform those policies um, kind of in a very simple, intuitive, one-step um, concept. So if I then go ahead and really fill this out for um, a drug called Dupixent, for example, for the plan of Medicare Part C, um, I am going forth and selecting um, the drug. I, I am going to go ahead and really just upload that policy as is. So oftentimes we've seen formats such as uh, PDF, Word, um, and we are expanding our suite of file format support. Um, and if I then go ahead and, and select the depiction, what we're typically um, familiar with is uh, something that kind of looks and smells like this, right? It's uh, something where I see some uh, preamble. It might be about the drug manufacturing, um, some information with regards to that. And if I go ahead and click um, back, oh, excuse me. that acting up. Sorry about that, guys. And what I'm trying to get at is, as I am uploading the Dupixent file, I am seeing the Composer AI engine working in the background. And so as that happened, what it's doing was kind of all of the things that Shannon mentioned. It's I am reading um, all of the contents of the policy, again, layering in all of the tenants that um, the AI model has already established with regards to clause transformation into question. And something that would otherwise take me a very long, tedious amount of time to do human transcription of, I have to retype everything, I have to reorganize everything. It's sort of already done for me. And then really empowering um, the PNT group or um, a pharmacy tech or pharmacy manager to be the ones that then kind of go through and comb through. And this could be, again, a clinician, if it's a medical a policy, and just really walk through um, and validate all of the things um, that were part of that policy and now is more of a question set. I then, um, we always call it decision tree because at the end of the day, this is essentially um, what that tree looks like where I am in fact routing um, a clinician through and I reach a decision. And in this case, and I apologize if this is very tiny for certain people to see, um, that you really reach a, a deny and approve um, or needs more information, which oftentimes is the case. And these rules are really established by our clients. Um, it, we really just, again, our platform just supports um, whatever workflow or rules that they have established. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop share and maybe Glenn, if you can um, pull up the care. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks, Glenn. Um, so after you have your criteria in the system, you've marked them as ready and you start getting PA key cases in, um, you're going to want to be able to create your PA case appeal or grievance um, in whatever format that comes in. Um, and uh, obviously the first step of that is entering the patient provider and request details. Um, during that intake process, you're going to confirm the decision tree that should be used. So um, we'll suggest one based on the plan and requested drug details, um, but the user can confirm that as well. Um, and then you're going to attach relevant patient documents. So it can be faxes, emails, EPA submissions, PDFs, really data in any format that you have. And then that's going to be sent off to um, our AI processing piece. Um, and so what our AI processing does inside of the computer assisted review engine is it uses all the questions that exist within your criteria. So it is specific to 
each client, each plan, and each drug. And it first looks through all the patient records and tries to find the relevant parts of each patient document that correspond to a question. So if it's something like a fax form where you directly have the question and then a selected answer, that's easy. If you're getting more patient records and you're looking for something a little bit more difficult to find, it looks for paragraphs within specific sections. Um, and it does that based on a model-based information retrieval approach. After that, it's gonna get sent to our question answering model, um, which is going to take your question and be able to provide the answer. So um, if you have things like, does the patient have a diagnosis of diabetes type two, we're gonna answer that as you know, yes or no, based on the evidence that we can find within the document. Um, if you have a question that's more of a multiple choice type question, um, we'll be able to answer what, which of the options are true based on relevant information found within the document for each option as well. Um, and then we're going to take the answers that we get to every single question in your criteria and then run them through your decision tree that you uploaded, you confirmed, and you validated to recommend a final PA determination status. So um, if the answers that we are automatically answering would lead to an approve, it will show up as a recommended determination of approve. And now obviously the most important piece of that is that it then goes to someone for manual review. So you as a user or a reviewer then go in and can see this is the recommended determination. Here's every question it answered to get me to there. And you can go in and look at the original patient documents, see the paragraphs that the model was using to come to that answer and say, I agree with this or I don't. Um, and then ultimately update your final determination. Um, and you as a user also have the ability to, even if you're answering the questions and your decision tree would lead to a status of approve or deny, but for some reason you wanna override what the decision tree you have previously approved is, there's that flexibility as well. Um, and additionally, the benefit of this is that you only need to answer the relevant questions to get to a determination. Um, but then you also have all the other answers to every other question in case you need to reference them um, for some sort of denial letter um, or when sending information back to a clinician. Um, and then of course, we take this data that you have confirmed and we cycle that back into our model retraining so that our model can update and so that it will be more and more accurate over time and continuously reduce the review times um, required. Um, so with that, back to Vanessa for a quick demo. Okay. Great. Okay, and I double checked that I'm not on mute this time. So <laughs> I won't be just rambling um, for, for a good 30 seconds before people tell me. Um, so as Shannon mentioned, uh, really the, the key components of being able to come to a decision or a determination um, faster is one, being able to pull the relevant um, data. And then second is to then also layer um, really not just the AI components or pieces, but also um, hard logic that really checks on the rules and the mappings of a given case. Um, and we call them case, but you know, again, depending on the terminology, um, folks say episodes, some folks um, just call them prior aughts. Um, but really, it's that marriage, right? It's a fine balance between how can we make things a little bit more um, intuitive, it flows a little bit better, it's simple, but not too simple. But then the evidence that I also have is verifiable as well. Um, and that really, at the end of the day, as um, I know Shannon mentioned this quite a few times, um, really there is a human expert that is double checking everything, but the, the pain and suffering of having to do all of that checking prior to and all those other in-between pieces um, 
essentially are, are prevented or it kind of goes away. Um, so what you're looking here is a very simple um, workflow that I'm gonna walk us through. Um, oftentimes we, we recognize that there's multiple intake methods such as EPA, such as um, you know structured portal formats. Um, that's typically not the biggest burden as we see in uh, prior auths and being able to support that. But oftentimes we get the structured field and it comes in as a structured field and boom, you get a decision um, or at least it runs through a question set and you're able to surface that information quite readily back even to the provider. Um, but what we're going to focus on is really um, in a situation of a fax, how does AI come into play and how does Banjo really then expedite some of that processing um, whenever we receive things of that nature. So uh, I'm going to walk through um, a fax that was inbound. Um, I don't have a fax simulator that's working in, in live, so I can't really do that right now. But really um, what I wanted to call out with regards to this particular screen is that as I'm looking through and receiving a fax um, intake, um, we recognize and read a part of that OCR um, that we talked about. We are able to read that form um, that, that we get, usually this is a cover letter, uh, cover, sorry, cover sheet, um, and all of its uh, packet, so to speak, the medical evidence packet. We are recognizing what the patient demographics looks like, their date of birth, um, certain values that are pretty much a part of every um, fax form uh, that, that has, you know, that a lot of clients and, and organizations support. And what's really important for our solution to do is then say, okay, well, if there are discrepancies in terms of our mismatch and uh, inability to um, capture or, or scrape um, those values, uh, how do we then allow the end user to be able to uh, just reconcile those values? So if I take a look at, at um, uh, William Blake here, um, I have a provider that I, I validated and ran through um, some of that layering that Shannon mentioned. Um, and I can actually view the original um, document that as it came in um, and really see that this is the prescriber information that is correct. It looks like it picked up MO instead of MD, for example. And I really just want to um, reconcile that. And so again, that marriage between what AI is doing and also like hard logic, as we call it, to rules-based um, development that also exists, what I'm targeting or looking at is know knowing that, hey, in terms of the basic information, not only do I see what the request came in for, but also the diagnosis, um, I know kind of um, what to pull um, piggybacking off of what was done in Composer. So. Um, if I then go ahead and continue, and I know that this is the order or the drug that I wish to select, um, it could be med um, medical procedure, it could be medical drug. If I then go ahead and click continue, there are several um, checks in place. Again, this is more um, systematic to our, our build and not so much AI, um, but I have multiple opportunities um, to do subsequent actions without having to leave the screen, all while being able to reference um, the initial information that is um, here. But I what I want to rally folks behind is really um, in the clinical review step, and that this is kind of where um, a few slides back, if you remember, the two blue tiles that contribute to a faster time to determination and lessening some of the, the cross-checking that exists, um, we're really taking a look at the ability for, one, the system to point directly to the appropriate decision tree based off of hard rules, but then also see that there, the question set that was brought in is, is now um, going to be answered. So. If I then really start the review, some of the highlighting that you're seeing in the um, reference document, um, the original documentation that was submitted, um, that really drives uh, a lot of what the decision making would look like and the ease of being able to surface information readily. So if I then go ahead and um, click through some of the evidence, it really then kind of 
um, points me directly to where I really need to see. And if there are, let's say, multiple instances of, of or occurrences of that mention, um, again, it could be acronyms, it could be abbreviations, it could be codes, um, it really anything surrounding clinical entity text recognition, um, those would be surfaced and really allow the wisdom of the SME um, to really come forth. So I would be doing my clinical review with this additional empowerment. It's not kind of having like a, a sidekick that's like, hey, it's actually here. Um, and, and this is the decision that you would ultimately make. So I'm going to just click through and, and walk through some of the, the highlighting. Um, and really, if let's say um, as part of the depicts and decision tree, if I answered a combination of these questions that would route me again, this is um, all the hard work that you had put in on the composer side, um, I would then really be able to um, meet and reach the end of the decision tree. And so rather than having to now exit cross-reference, multiple toggles, screens open. Um, I have the opportunity to know that, hey, based off of all the things that I clicked through and I double-checked all of the, um, the items that came through, I'm going to go ahead and, and reach my decision of approve and go ahead and save and submit. Um, I'm not going to cover the rest of that because, of course, you know there are, is a notification component that really closes out all of that. Um, but really, this is just a, a visual representation of how AI is really empowering at the, at the point of the clinical review process, um, how you can expedite um, straight to uh, determination. So going back to, I think we're going to just recap um, a, lo a lot of what we just talked about, I know it was quite a bit and there is a, a little bit of jumping around. Um, but as Shannon said, you know, I, where AI is today um, with regards to healthcare specifically, you can't entirely replace the human um, workforce, right? It's, it's not like any other industry where, it, okay, well, can we make the clinical reviewer a chatbot? Um, it kind of doesn't work that way. It requires um, to push it to its full sophistication and accuracy when it comes to um, the right, picking up the right values and making sure that there is this constant feedback loop. Um, that really is key to how well it, it will perform and how it would actually benefit your business instead of take away from it. Um, and I know folks are either, you know, just thinking about what's out there or potentially actively shopping for a solution um, or shopping AI as, to fold into their uh, solution. Really, um, what we champion or advocate are folks to really take a look at as they um, sit in front of folks that say they do AI is, you know, one, is there a clinical content team that drives the development of your AI, right? Um, oftentimes it might be very heavy on the tech, but is there actually a clinician who understands the PA workflow thoroughly? And um, we do have a internal clinical team um, that really drives and advises and consults on not only the, the relevance, um, aspect of it, what are we capturing that's clinically accurate, um, but also then saying how intrusive or not intrusive it should be uh, when it comes to the usability of AI. Um, in addition to that, um, how do I, what goals do I want to set um, as, I guess it's more asking yourself now, um, or asking your organization, what goals are we trying to accomplish by using AI? What do we want to shorten and by how much? Um, and in terms of my, almost like a self inventory of your appetite for iteration. Um, as we all know, AI does not behave the best or uh, is perfect out of the box. It requires a certain understanding um, and expectation setting that it may be a little uh, rough in the beginning, but um, with enough evangelism, evangelism, the data set, um, that feedback team uh, that is able to feed it better and smarter um, answers and then retrain on it, that that iterative process really is more of an investment um, than a, you know, a quick cure. Um, 
And it goes without saying that um, AI that works beautifully is a combination of both the usability as well as the function, right? So you can have um, accuracy with precision recall numbers and measurability, um, and you could get to let, let's say not you know not ninety eight percent accuracy for medical entity um, extraction, and you're able to say with you know X percentage of confidence that you know the determination was appropriate. Uh, but really, it's it's then coupling that with usability. Is it simple and non intrusive? Uh, is it uh, hopefully it doesn't distract my end users from what they have to get done? If I have you know references or links to all these different places uh, or percentage numbers, is that really helping or hurting um, my clinical reviewers or my um, decision tree maintenance folks uh, from being able to do their day-to-day -day jobs? Um, and then at the end of the day, it's the verifiability um, of all of those things that we say that we you can do, right? Um, it's then, can I trace back to the original document? Am I able to go directly to where that phrase is? That really gives it its, its power. Um, and really, um, at the end of the day, uh, Banjo aspires um, to really advocate on behalf of the patient to try and push care to be better um, so that, you know, folks, like our family members or ourselves, we're not waiting days, um, weeks even um, for a decision to be made and um, really get the care that we need in a very timely fashion. So thank you. Sorry, I had to unmute. So we have a lot of questions in the actual chat. Uh, if we don't get to your question in the next 15 minutes, uh, we will uh, reach out to you via email and try to answer that as best we can. Um, starting off, are you digitizing the defined rules using a database of common rules to train algorithms to make initial judgments? How are you deciding the right adjudication? What data are you using as the basis for these decisions? Uh, Glenn, do we have clarification if that's in regards to composer or care? We do not. Okay, um, I will go ahead and do my best to answer um, for both. Um, so for Composer, the data that's being intaken is your direct policy document that you're uploading. The labeling um, of that data comes from how you interact with that and when you're ready to publish it. Um, the process and the models involved um, are trained on data just like your policy document uh, that have been seen before. And then once we've seen yours, we update our models on that and you'll see better results on similar documents with the same format going forwards. Um, with regards to the care engine, there are a couple of pieces in place, um, but all of the data that it is processing on at one point is whatever is attached to the case. So um, a user attaches documents, um, an EPA gets submitted and gets attached. Um, and then if we were uh, had integrations to other data sources as well, those would also get attached to the case. Um, and then the processing of that, it runs through the data um, as if it was text um, and does natural language processing on it, both to determine what sections are relevant and then also to be able to answer the question. So it's taking, taking as input the list of questions from your previously approved criteria that you built in Composer, um, as well as the patient documents for that specific case. Um, and then answering the questions there. Uh, does that answer the question? Uh, I can't speak to that, uh, but I think it's <laughs> pretty well. Good job. Um, going to the next question, uh, and that was from Janice. And if Janice, if you have any follow-ups, please just send them into the chat. Uh, next question is Yuri. Uh, how do you bring different payer slash plan PA nuances into decision tree making processes? You want to go for it, Vanessa? Yeah, I'll I'll go for it. Um, and I'll just answer this uh, in a broader sense. And then if it really you know is specific to how AI 
um, comes into play. I'll, I'll, I'll just defer that. Um, but when it comes to, we recognize that every pair plan has their own work streams, their own um, even roles of how users are assigned and how um, essentially different queues could exist uh, with regards to how PAs are handled and at which point in the process. And I, I keep calling it custodians, um, like who is then responsible for when a PA then becomes, you know, a particular status or is part of this um, coverage state. Um, we've seen a lot of that. So um, what I would say generally is that oftentimes you'll see solutions, um, including ourselves, uh, have a layer of workflow um, rules, builders, um, and uh, turnaround time manager clocks um, that really support some of that um, movement. And then in terms of how then that would direct um, what a clinical reviewer would look at would come into play. So again, it leans a lot more heavily on the configuration side. And then really then um, when it comes to the medical evidence, what you're checking against that those rules then assist in the driving of, okay, this is what we're going to check up against. So um, again, just referencing um, the demo that I gave, it's then being able to say, okay, if, if this follows this, you know, some of these parameters, and drives me to this particular decision tree, this is the questions that I'm answering to, and the, these are the evidence points that um, support that. Okay, I'm going to try, there's several questions from uh, the same people, so I'm gonna try and answer at least one question from each of the people that asked a question. So this one comes from Marcia. Uh, how does this work with InterQual or the MCG guidelines? In terms of um, file formats, uh, if it's a matter of integration, um, we leverage APIs, um, kind of your, your open API standard. Um, you know, again, if it is more like a, a data dump uh, of sorts where you're receiving a batch um, upload or a batch file uh, with the, the content, we are not, we're vendor agnostic. Um, it, the way that it works then would be a matter of making sure that we can integrate with them. We do a handshake and then between the, the file that we're receiving or in the case of a webhook, if you need a more real time um, synchronization, that that would be um, something that needs to be mapped out, but that would be part of the um, onboarding process. Does this work within Medicaid guidelines? Yes. Um, so in terms of Medicaid guidelines, there's, there's several things, obviously, at the state level and some of our gnarlier states, as we know, Kentucky, Texas, um, you know, even California at times, um, all of those would, would be met. Again, it's um, the AI capture of the decision tree policies themselves is, is one aspect. And then as you use the Banjo PA platform with the configuration tools that I had mentioned before with regards to turnaround time clocks and um, queue management, um, we also have formulary managers in place, um, things of that nature that would assist in the driving and pointing to the right direction. Um, and then all of that is kind of coupled um, together when you use the platform. If more information is needed, that usually comes in the form of a medical record. Does it search the medical record to find the right answers? Yes, it does. Um, it can read medical records and any other form of text type data that you could think to send it. Does Banjo work with additional licensing partners to pull in this information to create questions slash workflows? Partners such as MCG. Oh, that question was already asked. Um, the decision tree you end up creating for PA is then repeated used for the same insurer and procedure drug. Is there a value in it is used for creating a decision tree for a medical necessity policy? 
I'll take that question. Um, we are really excited to partner with actually um, several clients that have mentioned um, re essentially reconstituting how Composer works today to do the medical necessity checking piece and be that one-stop shop um, for them as well. So yes, uh, it is possible to kind of enforce the same rules that you would otherwise have, um, but really instead of like approve or deny, for example, in a prior auth scenario, you're really saying, um, is this medically necessary? Yes or no. And then potentially even having like third or fourth end nodes to be able to say, oh, well, what if, um, prior auth is necessary or not. So um, there is flexibility in expanding um, the purpose of Composer, yes. Can you talk about some of the criteria used for model retraining and is it continuous or are there certain triggers that would initiate retraining? And if the latter, what might that trigger be? Yep, um, so uh, we run retraining uh, periodically. Um, and then additionally, if there's been a significant new data and the accuracy level is um, below a certain threshold that we agree with um, for the client. So generally we see that retraining happens more frequently upfront um, as we're getting new data in and seeing your data for the first time, um, and then would slow down kind of as performance um, gets a little bit more um, to a stable level, um, and there's less marginal value in each new data point. Do you provide any performance guarantees on the model itself? How good is it at answering criteria questions or PA determination as a whole? Yeah, um, so we do not provide any guarantees. Um, the model generally learns pretty quickly on new data that it's seeing. Um, but we don't guarantee any sort of accuracy number because every single client's data can end up looking different um, depending on uh, what type of criteria you have, their complexity, and then also what type of information you tend to receive when you're reviewing PAs. Um, and then I will answer the second half of the question by just saying the same thing. It varies uh, from client to client. Um, and based on complexity of the questions involved in the criteria as well. And then to piggyback off of Shannon's response, um, part of our onboarding um, or implementation process does include a, an evaluation period. Um, we have a data science implementation playbook that we run for all of our clients. Um, and again, it is then assessing the level of data maturity and comprehensiveness um, that they have. Also, we would specify exactly kind of what percentage of their data we would need to see or um, have uh, access to in order to be able to provide um, what performance would look like. Does your program integrate with Salesforce or claims systems? I'll take that one. Um, yes, so we at Banjo have a Banjo API um, that really um, has multiple, for lack of a better phrase, tendrils into um, the existing ecosystem. We recognize that there's integration endpoints on, on the intake side, as well as the post notification um, claims adjustment side as well. So um, on both sides, as well as kind of in between even, um, I know um, two of our clients are live with um, you know, eligibility. Um, they have also um, outbound notification send out. So again, it's um, again, the flexibility of the integration um, endpoints are there with our API. Are the decision trees created from the documents submitted for prior authorization, or is it a combination of configuration and data from the documents? Uh, they are created from the documents that you submit, specifically the policy documents that you submit. Thank you all for attending. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, please uh, let us know. and We'll be happy to answer any additional questions you guys may have. Uh, thank you for spending part of your afternoon with us, and we hope to be in touch with you soon.